Uh, we'll continue with uh, Stefan Fiebeck's uh, talk about auditing virtual appliances. Uh, please go on. All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the security of, of appliances in, in specific uh, virtual appliances. I'm Stefan Fieberg. I'm security consultant with Second Sight um, here in the Vienna office. Um, some, some prior research includes um, some, some rootkit I wrote together with um, Wolfgang Ettlinger, who is right over here. Um, uh, some insecure uh, Wi-Fi passphrases um, used in, by, by popular ISPs in, in Austria and Germany. And uh, I was the one who found uh, the Wi-Fi protected setup um, uh, vulnerability uh, design flaw thing a while ago. Okay. And what's important, um, most of this, this, this stuff was done together with Wolfgang. So he knows basically the same thing as, as I do. I'm giving the talk. He's listening. So, but he, he also uh, did, a, did, a, did a great job there. Okay. Um, so what's this talk about? Um, I want to wanna discuss um, some analysis techniques um, specific to virtual appliances, but also um, some, some general techniques used for, for, for Linux systems. And, and raise awareness about um, serious vulnerabilities in, in appliances in general. So we'll talk about um, getting root, getting root shell on appliance, which is the first step of the analysis process. Then analyzing the, the hardening state or general configuration, configuration state of the system. And then we'll move on to the, to the, to the meat, to the actual application that run on the, on the appliance. And um, then I'll share a few thoughts about incident response, um, risks involved with, with using appliances, trusting appliances, and stuff like that. So um, what's an appliance? Um, basically, it's, it's nothing magical. It's just a Linux system or some other open operating system running a lot of open source software and some uh, proprietary applications. That's the, the applications you actually pay for. The rest is, is open source. Um, most of the vendors don't want you to know that it's just Linux and just Samba and just Apache and Java and stuff like that. So they, they try to, to kind of mask it, but so if, if you peek a little behind the, 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 the curtains, it's, it's just, just regular stuff you, 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 you see uh, on a database. Um, here's some, some example products, example vendors, um, almost all major vendors now. Uh, offer these, these virtual editions of the hardware appliances. Um, so the, the list goes on and on and on. And yeah, um, so why would you like to use a virtual appliance? It's, of course, it's fast deployment, it's easy, easy configuration, all the, all the cool stuff that comes with using virtual machines. Um, no hardware, cool. Um, same thing goes for um, vendors. They don't have to offer hardware. They don't have to uh, have people on the ground who, who do on-site support, fix, fix hardware components and, and stuff like that. So maybe it's more money. I don't know. Could be a reason. Um, so there are a few problems that the vendor have vendors have recognized. Um, they involve the, the intellectual property and, and al also the, the licensing of, um, of specific appliance features. So what they're trying to do is uh, keep you from, from uh, getting deeper access to the appliance. And so the, the things we've seen in, mostly involve uh, kinds of encryption and obfuscation and stuff. But it's, well, it, it's, it's, it, there's no in-depth security anyways. So it's, it just um, takes, takes you longer to, to find something cool. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's nothing serious. Um, so researchers. Um, uh, for researchers and attackers, uh, virtual appliances are cool because, as opposed to medical devices, you can you can get them them them, them mostly for free for testing. Um, salespeople are, are happy to, to give it, give them to you. Maybe they will call you ten times a day, but um, that, that's something you have to ignore. 
and it's it's a, a great system to to do debugging because once you've got um, root access, you have access to all the source code, all the binaries. You can can change configuration, um, enable debugging, enable more error output, um, maybe use some some kind of debugging VMX stuff, and you can enhance the, the quality of the of the audit of the appliance uh, in times times one thousand or something. So what you can do is once you found critical vulnerabilities, you can can also use them, use the exploits uh, on physical appliances because they share the same code base. So, getting root, first, first step. Um, as I've said, um, usually you only have access to a web interface and um, maybe some, some anchor assist dialog or some, some kind of restricted command line interface, um, which doesn't give you the ability to, to run uh, arbitrary, arbitrary commands. So what you want to have is a shell um, and best case, a root shell. So now we are on to getting a root shell. Um, I'm going to discuss uh, some, some files that make up the, uh, make up the, the, the virtual machine on, the, on the, the VM host side. So there's this VMX file, there's this VMDK file, which, which is the disk the hard disk in the virtual machine, and there's the VM files, um, VMAM files. The, the VMAM files are very interesting. They are a one-to-one -one image of the physical memory. So this is um, like you, like the stuff that's on the, on the, on the RAM, on, on your, your mainboard. Um, it's used for snapshots of running systems, and also for um, storing the, the physical memory when you suspend the, the VM. And so now we are going on to um, using these different attack vectors, um, starting with the disk attack vector. So this is the most simple thing. You take a VMDK, mount it. Um, you've, you have access to all the data on the, on the disk. So the physical variant would be to disassemble the, the appliance, um, take the hard disk, put it in, in another computer and change stuff on the disk. So what, what's the things you want to change? It's the password, pass, password file, the, the shadow file, sudo file, all, all of that. If the hard disk is not encrypted, um, you're done at this point. You have a new user which has root privileges or the, the ability to, to sudo and stuff like that. So this is, this is the, the easiest, easiest way. And it, this, this way it works for, for most appliances. But the, the other ones which use encryption. So they, the ones I've seen use um, uh, LUX and, and loop AS, and they're using some kind of, of modified versions of it. Because they, they have the problem that the, the passphrase for the decryption of the AS master key has to be present at the time of boot. So this is something shot the after grub or something in the context of the, of the kernel pboot. Um, and the vendor isn't present to, to enter this key for you, so they have to, to somehow do a trick. And what they're doing is they use a hard-coded key and somehow obfuscate it, obfuscate the mechanism to, um, to de-obfuscate it, all, all kinds of that. So this is just security by obscurity. And if you spend some time reverse engineering, debugging the, the code, you, you'll find uh, access to the to the, the passphrase and then can go on and and decrypt all the all the other volumes. So I've uh, now I have a, a little example. This is the, the hard disk of F5 Firepass. Um, as you can see, only the, the first partition is recognized. Um, the others are unknown. In this case, they are encrypted. Um, and on the first partition, you're going to find some interesting files. So this is LO setup and GPG and rootkey GPG. So they're using loop AS. Um, rootkey contains the AS master key and is encrypted using a passphrase, which has to somehow magically be entered into the GPG prompt. And the way that F5 has implemented this is they've changed LO setup to um, use the, the passphrase file descriptor um, parameter. So they're passing a file descriptor to GPG, 
and the parent process um, then writes every single character up to a, a new line into this file descriptor. And at this point, the GPG process has the, the full passphrase and can go on to decrypt the GPG file. So what I've done um, is some, some dirty patching. Um, so I've enabled the, re-enabled the, the, the standard error output and added some code to the GPG binary to, to basically print the passphrase mount sits fully retrieved. Um, and then call jump uh, then, then use the jump dollar instruction to 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 go into an endless loop. So this is really really dirty stuff. It's but it works. Um, and I've I have a short demo. So this is the the, the virtual machine running Firepass. It starts the boot. And the font is too small. To, to actually see something, but it doesn't matter at this point. So um, what we're seeing here is um, the, the boot process has stopped. So this is this endless loop. And the last line that was printed uh, contains the AS, uh, the, the passphrase used for the decryption of this GPG file. And now I can go and, and type um, using visual recognition, type each and every uh, character of this, of this string. And, and can, can decrypt the, the other partitions and yeah, um, remove some, some, some other stuff that, that makes um, getting a proper shell harder. And yeah, so th this way we, we have a root shell and can go on with, with the other analysis. So on this, in the file pass, we find a ton of PHP files which look like on the bottom left. So the left is a, a hex editor view. So we've got basically garbage, encrypted garbage. And when we go ahead and try to um, analyze these PHP files, um, or rather the, the, the programs that use these PHP files, we, we're going to find out that they're using GPG in a static key, and the decryption takes place in libphp. So Apache uses libphp, the modified F5 version of libphp, and every time a, a PHP file is evaluated, um, they, they decrypt it for evaluation. So this is the way they, are, they, have, have, they are doing this. And the nice thing about, um, the, ni the nice thing is if you implement the decryption yourself, you can get um, um, full uh, PHP code with development comments and all of the, of the nice stuff. Of course, this enhances the quality of the, of the analysis, as I said. And we've, we've also found, uh, yeah, several vulnerabilities, and this was, was a while ago. So another um, route would be to use um, the physical memory way. So we, we've, as we've just discussed before, the VMAM files are a one-to-one -one dump of the physical memory, um, and we can manipulate this file. Um, so the, the physical equivalent for this attack would be um, these, these kinds of DMA attacks via FireWire and, and, and other, other components, other buses. Um, cold boot, not really. OK, so um, what we thought about is um, other people have implemented this for FireWire, where you can, can plug a FireWire cable into another laptop. Um, and do some pattern matching, patch some, some authentication code, which in a way that, that it always returns true. So you can enter any password, you, you, can, you, get a, you can log in. This, this works for, for, for some, some Windows versions, some Ubuntu, whatever versions, but it's, we found out that it's hard to, to find generic um, uh, patterns and generic patches which work across um, years of, of, of Linux kernel, Linux, uh, other Linux, Linux component code. So, so this is a bit hard. Um, then we, we had another thought, which was um, we could just go and patch shell code anywhere in this VMAM file and hope that it gets executed by a process that has root privileges or is the kernel, which is kind of a shotgun approach and could, should work at some point in time, but it's not reliable. And 
another, yeah, so th this, this, is, this was the first um, ideas we had. Um, one thing about this, this VMAM file is um, it doesn't contain all the information to map, um, to get access to the virtual memory of processes. So maybe I can take you back to the university or something. Um, so we've, we've got paging. Um, paging is a problem in this, in this case. Um, on, the, on the bottom right, we see that um, the, the physical memory has, has, has no blue lines going back to the, to the virtual memory. Um, that's because um, we are missing some, some critical information like the value of the, of the CFE register. So this is a, a register specific to each process, which points to um, the, the bottom of the page dictionary, and parts of the virtual addresses are used as, as indexes. And yeah, so this, this, is, this is how paging works. It doesn't really matter at this point, but uh, in fact, we can't go back um, without knowing um, information about kernel structures or some, some really smart way to, to find values of CS3 registers used in, in, in the context of the kernel. Um, another problem is, um, so another, another fact for the, the Wiemann file is, um, if you look at it, it's just um, 4K blocks in basically random order. You, you've got everything in there, but maybe you get a, a page of kernel memory, a page of process A, a page of process B, and then, then so this is, this is totally random, um, uh, from, from an outside view, and so this is, this is hard to, to get um, the, the, the mapping, the backwards mapping. Um, we did it in another way, um, so we, we wanted to patch the, the VMA files. Um, we, did the, we did it the easy way, we, wanted, we didn't want to patch code, we wanted to patch data. So um, what we are doing is we are using the, the disk cache feature, which is uh, a performance feature which caches um, files in memory. So the thing is, if you read a file twice, it will only result in one actual access to the hard disk. The, the second read is, uh, is, is served from the cache file, uh, from, from, the, from the cache memory. So um, once uh, the password file has been accessed once, we can find a copy in the memory and modify it. The same goes for shadow, um, sudos, all of that. So this way we can, can manipulate these files to add new users, uh, change passwords of users, remove passwords of users, uh, add users to the sudos file, and all of that. So we have some, some tool, we don't have a name for it, but we, we will have eventually, um, which basically is a, an optimized web, so we go through each and every page, look at it, if look at if look at the start and and, and look at um, the look at if check if it's ASCII, so and then we we get the string until the first zero byte and apply our regexes which identify if it's a shadow password file, all of that. So here's a okay no here's the generic approach we will take. So just suspend the VM, use our tool to, to dump the files, um, then add to the files a new user, use a proper shell, you add a hash to the shadows file, add the user to the sudos um, file, and again use the tool to, to persist the changes back to the VMAM file. Then we can resume the VM, and, and now we can log in via uh, depends on the configuration via SSH telnet or at least via the terminal. Okay, so here's a short demo. This is just a standard Ubuntu server. Um, we are trying to log in as root, which doesn't work. Login incorrect. Then we are going to suspend the virtual machine. And use our tool, so the output is not that, yeah, uh, not that important actually. So this tool scans through the VMAM file um, and dumps two files. In this case, it's PassWD and Group. The other files haven't been used. The shadow hasn't been used at this point, or something like that. 
and now we can go and remove the, the disabled flag from the from the root root uh, line in the in the password file. Save the file and then use the persist um, parameter to to save the changes back to the vmem file. And now we can resume the VM and try to log in as root again. This time with no password prompt and we are in. So this is the general way. And using this way, you can also add new users, can change passwords of users, all of that. So this is, this is I, I can't think of a situation where you, you can't get in using this method. Okay, there's another um, attack vector which we've identified. Um, I'm just going to touch it briefly. It's um, remote debugging. So this is the remote debugging feature that uh, VMware implements. Um, you can activate it using these, these lines. This is the physical equivalent of JTAG, so CPU level debugging, um, which results in, in, in two ports that are listening on localhost. And then you can go on and use GDB to to um, connect to the to the to, to the CPU or to the to the VM and and the different CPUs. So at this point, um, CPUs are, are, are just visible as threads. In in so what you're seeing is a CPU context and not a process context. There are no symbols, um, so it's uh, quite painful to to use actually. But um, for for analysis, it can can be useful. Okay, now on to the system state. So what we are trying to do when analyzing the, the basic system state is um, we want to expand access and, and escalate privileges and, and assume that we found some, some exploits in, in, in a component already. So let's say we, we've got uh, command injection in the, in the in a web location. Um, so these vulnerabilities are uh, useful for, for all kinds of post exploitation and give you an idea about um, how the security posture of an appliance is. is yeah. So the baseline is, so, so what you would compare the results to is a usual proper configured normal server in your usual environment. So if, if, if there are differences, you might um, might not use this, this appliance if, 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 if there, are, there are significant differences and defici deficiencies. So this can be partly automated and is not very time consuming. So what we are doing is basically the list of this and some, some other stuff. So we are looking at um, the privileges of services, um, look if there are some, some SVD binaries running, uh, uh, lying around, um, maybe some, some incorrect Improper folder permissions, file permissions. Um, yeah, so it's patch management is a huge is, is issue in appliances. Windows don't like to patch stuff because it they don't they now have to test stuff when they patch stuff and um, they end up with um, ten year old libraries in their code and so this this is this is a, a huge problem. So you can go along and, and check which versions to use are, are they still up to date and stuff. Um, the next thing I would look at is firewalling. Are there any services that shouldn't be there allowed to 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 be um, to to uh, allowed to to be um, accessible from the network side? And another thing is is backdoors. So this, these are remote access things that are implemented by vendors to provide. Um, support for customers. We've seen that a lot. And so if you think about it, it's, it's of course, it's not a good idea to, to use these things. And, and, and you might want to find out which kind of backdoor is, is in place and then talk to the vendor. Maybe you can, can remove it or you can configure your firewalls accordingly. And another one is backdoor and support accounts. So there have multiple instances of, of um, leftover accounts or accounts used by support uh, on systems. Um, and there have been some, some SSH pub keys um, lying around um, 
which um, which are present, which which are already in the in the in the release versions, which are already contained in the release versions of the of the of the of the appliances. So this, these are um, these are generated by the by the vendors. So let's move on to the application side. Um, here's a, a little little graphing um, containing the the, the the programming languages you are you're going to encounter. So this is nothing special. This is this is standard application security. Um, so we you 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 very likely to see web applications, um, some custom backend services, some proprietary services which are exposed to the local network or the internet. And all of this code makes makes up the core functionality of the appliance. So this is the stuff you pay your money for. Um, all of this can be used, uh, can, can be done with uh, standard techniques. So it's manual and automated testing. So we have a focus on manual testing, um, not so much automated testing, but because vendors already use automated testing and they, they fail. Um, there's uh, reverse engineering, of course, before, for, for binary stuff. Um, um, some some proprietary protocols which can be fast, so it's the, the whole the whole range. And this is the part that is really time consuming. So if you want to really audit uh, an, an appliance from from bottom up, um, it takes you months or years. So, but of course, it depends on the on the target. So if you just want to find a lot of zero days, you maybe can get away with using some some fancy grep. Um, grabs um, and and find your, your your vulnerabilities this way because there's a, a lot of code and and it's it's generally not not the best code. Um, so a few a few hints from me for people who want to look at appliances maybe. Um, so the applications are still the best way to to get into the appliance. Um, there are the the most vulnerabilities are found in, in the applications. And these are most likely um, uh, exposed to the to the LAN or parts of the LAN and to the internet. And of course, using using uh, custom scripting and custom request forgery, you can trick internal users into um, e uh, executing the ex attacks for you. So, yeah. And there's a lot of a lot of old legacy um, code with very bad. Um, Bad coding, coding practices. Um, another another hint is to enable um, all kinds of debugging outputs. Um, so if you want to get get behind all the all the complexity of the of the of the applications on the appliance, it helps to to see which components talk to to which components and a lot of that. And also the the secret query log um, also will, um, reveals some information about the. Uh, the, the, the connections between between single components, which action um, results in this and this and this query. So this, these kinds of questions. Okay, and another another hint would be to to um, find out how all these fancy Java PHP frameworks work. They are uh, very very complex, and um, the, even the developers don't know how to use them properly. So it's it's a good idea to, to, to learn it yourself and then then find some obscure bugs um, yeah that, that nobody would, would would consider. Okay. So I'm going to share some thoughts about um, incident response and appliances, but before I want to show you a, a list of security appliances um, we've had a look at and and we've, we've discovered um, critical vulnerabilities, or mostly critical vulnerabilities in these appliances. So this is just for, as you can see, these are not just some, some small, small vendors. These are, these are the really big ones. Um, they've got huge problems in regards of um, application security. Um, and although they, they are usually at this, all of these security conferences and, and stuff, they, they don't have uh, figured it out quite, quite yet. 
Um, okay, so let's play a little mind game. Um, let's assume you are responsible for one or more security appliances and one of them has, has been compromised. Here's the question, how and when will you find out about it? I'm coming back to this in a second. So um, the risks involved with using security appliances are quite obvious. Um, they are in, in very prominent places in your network. They act as, as routers, they act as proxies, they act as uh, some kind of tunnels. Um, they are right in the middle of all the traffic, have uh, even some, some private keys for CA certificates that are used internally. Um, so this, this, is a, this is a huge issue. So if, if some of these appliances, if, if one of these appliances is compromised, an attacker can get a lot of um, insight, a um, lot, of, lot of information just by sniffing at the, at the local network interfaces or sniffing between applications and, and stuff. So this is just contain is in this appliance, the attacker hasn't, ju just, uh, the attacker doesn't have to leave the appliance to, to get um, more information. Um, also they receive and contain very critical information. Just as, as I've said, um, there, are, there are CA certificates which are installed uh, company-wide and used for SSL man in the middle. So these web filter solutions, web security solutions, which scan uh, HTTPS traffic for, for, for malware basically, have these, these private keys. So your, maybe your, yeah, so for sure your, your, your filter solution would have uh, this, this private key contained somewhere on the hard disk. Also there are um, passwords for other backward um, services, servers on the, on the hard disk. And also the appliances generally do receive um, plain text versions of um, passwords for domain users. So let's assume um, you set up your MDM client on your, on your mobile device you enter your domain credentials, the MDM receives the domain credentials, passes it on to the LDAP, all of that, but at some point in time, the MDM has the plain text version of your domain password. Um, and of course, there are, there are lots of um, privacy issues um, concerning um, these, of these proxy solutions, um, filter solutions um, regarding uh, browser cookies and all of that. Um, so, in, in, in my, from my point of view, uh, security appliance is the perfect staging ground for, for threat attacks. They are, they are effectively a black box, there's no monitoring, you can't compare the state of an, of an appliance to, to any known good state because you don't even know what services should be running and, and which shouldn't be running. So this is, this is impossible for, 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 for anyone except the the vendor to, to know what's, what should be there. Um, and of course, administrators don't have um, root share. So how would you um, find some, 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 some malware, some intrusion, if you don't even have a shell on the device? But problems. Okay. So again, back to the sinking ship. Um, so how and when will you find out about the compromised security appliance? Um, it's, it's, from my point of view, there are just two possibilities. I can't think of, think of any more, but, but maybe you can. So when the attacker does something really, really stupid and, and, and kills the, reboots the appliance several times, maybe then the vendor support comes in and detects that something is running that shouldn't be running. That's, that's a possibility. Or um, the, the appliance starts password boot fussing against some internal service or something like that, which can be traced back to the, to the appliance. Another possibility is that it, the attack is, at a very late stage, um, has already um, some financial impact, some, 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 some obvious loss of intellectual property, which when it is, I don't know when, when, when this, this, this could be obvious. But still, um, it's, it's quite impossible to pinpoint this back to one single appliance which is insecure. So it's either never or when it's uh, far too late. Um, okay. Good. 
So I'm, I'm doing good in time. Um, here are just some, some takeaways for security researchers. Uh, basically, um, look at virtual appliances. They are very easy to get. Um, they contain a ton of vulnerabilities. Um, uh, vendors are happy to give them to you. And yeah, security management, this is the serious part. Um, expect uh, your appliances to be insecure, contain critical vulnerabilities, maybe tons of them. Expect them to be compromised at this point in time. And yeah, so do audit them just like your network, your applications, your, your systems. And um, if you're uh, installing a new appliance, um, go ahead and audit the appliance before you use it in production. This is going to save you a, a huge headache. Okay, and vendors, this is obvious. Do something, and if you don't do, if you're not already doing something, try a lot harder. Okay, thanks. That's it for me. Um, again, thanks to, to Wolfgang and all of the, the second art teams worldwide, and of course you for, for being here. And yeah, thank you. Are there any questions? I'll try to put up the, the slides and the, the tool um, on a blog in the next days. We can okay. process. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, sure. It's it's just maybe 100 lines of Python. It's nothing special, really. Well, thank you very much for your talk.